I got to imagine that somewhere along the line, and that's what we hear, you know, here on Maintainer Spotlight, is that we see people that want to support their work. And if, if not rewarded in certain ways, not so much just monetarily, but rewarded or appreciated, there's opportunity for resentment. And you've got to find a way to find a reward. And if it's not money or some other way, you got to find something that sustains your soul to keep doing the creativity and making the make. Totally agree. I think when we are young, we usually, we just think about uh, how much happiness that project brings to you. And that's a huge factor, huge variable. Uh, but yeah, as time goes by, like there are other priorities, other things you have to take care of. And if you can diversify your streams of income, right? Like, okay, I have my job. It's paying well. I'm happy. I don't want to leave my job at all. But if I can generate new streams of income with something that I love, man, why not? Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Welcome back, friends. This is the Change Local Podcast featuring the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators of the software world. We have a great Maintainer Spotlight episode for you today. Zeno Rocha joined us to talk about his passion for open source and how he's changed his mind on making money with open source. We also talk about his big release of Dracula Pro and the future of Dracula. And of course, his new book, 14 Habits of Highly Productive Developers. Stay tuned to the end of the show for details on how to get your hands on a free copy of Zeno's book through our giveaway. This special flavor of the change law called Maintainer Spotlight is co-produced in partnership with our friends at Tidelift. Check them out at Tidelift.com. All right, let's do this. Zeno, we're back, man. Got you here. It's been what, years, I think. Yeah, I don't even know how many years, but yeah, it's so good to be back. We started with lessons learned last time. We were talking about open source lessons learned. And I, mm-hmm. You got a really interesting story. I, I recall you being in the hospital or something like that, and you created Dracula. <laughs> so we'll talk about Dracula, making money in open source, and your thoughts on that. This Dracula Pro thing that's kicking butt out there. This book you got going on. But yeah, so much going on. What has changed with your idea around open source? I mean, Dracula Pro is obviously a money-making thing. Mm-hmm. It's a profit thing for you. So mm-hmm. When we talked before, you weren't really into making money with open source. What's changed? Man, I, I always hated that idea of making money with open source. And looking back now, I think, oh my gosh, why did I even think about like that in the first place? I think there's always this distinction of, oh, open source is like everything free and, and that's it. And the opposite of that is, okay, let's make money, let's sell. And I always hated salespeople, that sort of thing. And... What changed was actually curiosity. I think that's the best way to describe it. Back in 2019, at my regular job, my nine to five, I wanted to learn more about sales, understand how the business worked. And I was like, yeah, I can read some books. I can try to figure out how the sales pipeline at my company works. But I think the best way to learn is like by doing yourself, right? So I looked at all my open source projects, and I received like an email from Google Search Console and with all the sites that I have on my analytics and I saw there was like a million page views on the Dracula site and I was like, oh my gosh, there's something here. So I decided to take a shot on that project in particular and that's how it all got started. Like, okay, I'm going to try this sales thing work and if it works, great. If it doesn't, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to survive. Yeah, it was pretty much like that. Well, I think people have a misconception of what sales is. I think that's why people hate salespeople. Mm-hmm. There's some really bad ones out there. Yeah. Yeah. Sales really is just a vibe exchange, mm-hmm. right? Solving problems, helping people. And I think we get this sort of misconfiguration of what sales is, and we're like, ah, we don't want to be that icky person. Exactly. You know? Yeah, I think the stereotype of a salesperson is one who convinces you to purchase something that you don't want or need. Mm-hmm. And that is where the icky comes in because it's like, stop pushing this wares on me, man. You know, like I do not want Mm -hmm. to drive this car home. I'm just (laughs) here to waste an hour or whatever the the context is. Yeah. And so 
I absolutely understand that stereotype, but like Adam said, and that's the difference between like a good salesperson and a bad salesperson. A lot of times they'll say, hey, it's all about the product. Like if I believe in the thing, it yeah. sells itself. Like the best salespeople are working on the things that sell themselves because that's how you have success in sales. You can't sell something that nobody wants or that you don't believe in. So, Which makes sense for Dracula being, I guess, in quotes, easy transition free. We'll talk about the easiness of it, but a million page views to Dracula theme. Uh, was it Dracula theme dot com? I mean, people want it. That's pretty interesting. Is that in one month? Is that like for a year? What's the time frame? Yeah, that was like for a whole 2019. And I was like, OK, I think we can do something about it. And I started thinking, OK, like if I were to sell this somehow, how that would be? I don't know about you guys, but I, I've never seen anyone selling a, a code theme before. So I was like, no, I think you might be the first one. So I was like, OK, this is going to be pretty insane. Like uh, nobody pays for that. This is free. This is all open source. So how can I turn something that everybody uses for free into something that actually adds value? That was my whole mentality uh, back then. Hmm. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, what'd you land on? Yeah, so many interesting points, many interesting points. The first one <laughs> was, okay, the product itself, right? What people are actually using. Like when I started Dracula, I picked some random colors that I liked and that was pretty much it. This time I was like, okay, let me truly understand how colors work. Uh, let me like read some books, read some papers about color theory, how to assemble different uh, color palettes, there's so many different ways uh, to think about this. And uh, this is a topic that designers like a lot, right? And they know a lot about this. I didn't know anything about this. But like any programmer, it's like, okay, let, let's learn it, you know? So I started learning about that. So I was able to do something that felt good and there was mathematically uh, uh, appropriate and it made sense. And then from there, I was trying to think, okay, how can I really cause some sort of transformation in people's lives? Because I can do all these nice colors for your Vim, for your VS Code, for your iTerm and your terminal, but how can that really make a difference in your life? So that's when I started thinking, okay, maybe if I put something like a book, some sort of ebook that I write, maybe this is going to add that value. So I was just trying to assemble pieces, you know, like another piece is fonts. So if I look at the most interesting fonts out there and there's a whole trend in terms of ligatures, okay, that's another interesting point. Um, at the same time, I was looking at Apple and uh, what Apple was doing. And there was pretty much two trends that I saw Apple doing. Like one was having their pro products. So AirPods Pro, like something, anything Pro, and the iPad mm -hmm. Pro, and also they going heavily on dark mode. So, okay, that's another interesting point. And another trigger for me maybe was the fact that I saw other people making money with Dracula. That was not me. So, Oh, really? What were they doing? Yeah, we were doing like a, a keyboard with Dracula keycaps. And, okay, and they were selling them? Yeah, they were selling them. And I think they, they broke a record of sales. Like one of the companies, they sold like more than a thousand keyboards. And I was like, oh my gosh, like people are making serious money with Dracula and <laughs> I'm just here <laughs> sitting around. <you." laughs> and I'm not doing it. That is not me. <laughs> oh no. And I'm not getting the cut. Yeah, so... That's uh, there's a lot of you triggers. You didn't email them your royalty program. <laughs> no, like it was my <laughs> fault. It's like MIT, so you can do whatever you want. But yeah. right, you could have written some sort of lawyer esque thing <laughs> just to see if they'd fall for it. You know, like by the way, yeah. you owe me the money. Yeah, interesting. That's funny. I didn't know that part of the story. That no, I didn't either. Keyboards and other people are making money off of it. Yeah. Was well, it just like the logo of it, or what did the keyboards do differently that made them drag the keyboards? Just the colors, and then other companies. Uh, do you know the Bear app? Oh, okay. The notes, the note taking app called Bear. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm familiar bear. With that. Yeah. yeah, like a bear, like the yeah. animal. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you want to uh, have the Dracula theme there. You have to pay. So it's uh, another, they have like this paywall for themes. So another company making money out of that. So I was like, okay, my turn now. <laughs> my turn, <laughs> my turn. 
So people must really love the Dracula theme. I mean, when I go into the themes for an editor, there's tons of them. Mm-hmm. I think Solar Rise is one I land on quite a bit. They have a light and a dark. Dracula, I see sometimes. And everybody who talks about Dracula loves it. I've never actually yeah. given it a try. Adam, I know you're a user and even a Dracula yeah. pro person over there. Mm-hmm. What is it about Dracula? Is it just like you land on the best colors there are? Or why do people love it so much from your perspective? What do people tell you about it, Zeno? For me, I think uh, it's the fact that it's multi platform, cross platform, and it's everywhere. When I started the theme was because I wanted to have on my terminal, on my code editor, on my browser. And I missed that unique experience. So I I truly Mm. believe that there's a huge cost when you're switching context all the time. And I think by having like a natural transition between different applications, you're still like your mind is still there, right? This is one of the reasons why developers hate Jira so much. And they love GitHub issues because their code and the issues, it's one place. But if they have to switch uh. to Jira, okay, so now I have to think about that. And Jira yeah. is not good in so many ways. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, it's not the only thing they don't like about it, but point taken. Yes. Well, maybe from a user's perspective, Adam, what is it about Dracula that... For me, I like dark themes. Yeah, I, I like dark themes. I like Zeno. There you go. It's too easy. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to use editors that are supported. Yeah, a personal attachment to it. Yeah. For Pro, though, what I think was really interesting was being able to go beyond a text editor. And so, like, I've got my Alfred themed in that way. So, I think if you rewind a little bit, what I like is the story, right? The idea yeah. of Dracula. And I also like Zeno. So, it was easy to say, okay, well, he's got this thing. I'm sure he's been working hard on it. I've used Dracula in the past for free. Mm-hmm. Might as well find a way to support him as a maker. And as a person I, I'm a fan of, and I also enjoy Dracula. Like I, I now use it in code. I use it in, uh, you've made it really easy to use in Oh My ZSH. Yeah, you know, I just flipped the theme, installed it, flipped the theme. And then the same with Alfred. So like in my, in Terminal, in VS Code, and in Alfred, which is, I guess, a, I don't know how to describe Alfred. If you don't know what it is, check it out. I think it's alfredapp.com or something like that. But all those things are themed with my preferred version, which was uh, Van Helsing. That's my that's my flavor. I like dark themes, so that's me. Cool. So, what'd you land on in terms of the pricing structure and how that works out and the details there? Because I noticed it doesn't seem like it's monthly or annually. That's a great question. I wonder why you chose that. Yeah. So another thing that I I started to pick up when you look at your behavior as a consumer you can already identify some patterns, right? And I think one pattern that we all have right now is having this burnout in terms of subscriptions. Uh, There's always a new subscription. There's always a monthly plan. And now we are all going to these budget apps so we can identify those missing subscriptions that we forgot. We're not using it anymore. (laughs) Exactly. We're still paying it, but we don't use it. Exactly. And... I was like, okay, I don't want to do subscriptions, even though I think it's the best pricing model ever. I truly believe it. I didn't do it because I I don't think it's good. I actually think it's the best, way better than what I I landed. Uh I wanted to give it a try. So I I decided to set on a one-time payment and see what will turn out from that. So I first thought about two different strategies. I said, okay, let me do one application for nine bucks and I do 10 applications for 49 bucks. That was my my whole idea because the reason why people use Dracula besides being a nice dark theme and all that, it's because it's cross-platform. So they ended up going to the 49 just because it has all the apps. And if someone can't pay 49, then they just go for the nine. So I thought about that, and on the day before I launched, I was talking to some friends, and and he said, like, do you really think that the transformation that you want to cause on on people's life, it's going to happen if you do the nine bucks? And what about the support of that? How much more support do you need to provide? And do you think it justifies the nine bucks? And I thought a lot about that, and I said, yeah, it doesn't. So I'm just going to go with 49 and I know it's expensive. Mm-hmm. If you live in the U.S., it's already expensive. But if you live in other countries, it's like super expensive. And I said, yeah, that's it. Like if you can't pay, unfortunately, 
uh, that's totally fine. You can still use the free theme with more than 100 applications supported. So I landed on that and uh, that was my goal. So when I launched in February uh, 11th, and I think in the, the first three days, it already hit like, I guess the first day was like already $3,000 and then the first three days, seven. And then the first like two months, I think 20000 And then right now I can actually check <laughs> to see, to give you the most accurate number. So from February 11th until now, which is like four months, something like this, Forty-six thousand and eight hundred and eighty dollars. So that was something completely crazy. Like when I see these numbers, I'm like, okay, there's probably something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a bug on the system or something. <laughs> yeah, who wrote this system? Right. But it's like it's something like Adam said something really, really nice. I think people want to support makers. You know. Yeah. They truly believe that if I do my part and everybody does their part everybody with a better product so i think there's a a big part of that too Mm. i wouldn't undercut the idea of story i mean who doesn't want to use the variant called blade Mm -hmm. (laughs) or morbius you know what i mean like when you got dracula you don't just have dracula i saw there was a buffy in there as well there's there's blade buffy lincoln morbius van helsing (laughs) And I think that's just super cool. Like you've wrapped this emotion, the story into it. And I think that's where we, people underplay the value of story. Yeah. And even more so Baxter, like you personally, but then the story of what this is and, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of the color concepts and stuff like that. You know, the the science behind some of these things mm-hmm. in terms of like geometric color palettes and, you know, circle of hue and modern color theory. Like th- this is a lot of stuff you put a lot of real work into. Not that Dracula wasn't, like the work was really the support of the different themes. As mm-hmm. you had said, you'd already just picked colors you liked, roll with it. Whereas here you've taken a more concerted effort towards color, themes, names, story, et cetera. And like there's clearly some value here. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't undercut that personally. Mm-hmm. So don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, put, you put some work into yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. On, while we're on pricing, you mentioned how the price is expensive even in the U.S., but you go to other places around the world and it's exorbitantly expensive, mm-hmm. not even approachable for some people. I learned something recently from Quincy Larson from Free Code Camp, and he was on the JS Party podcast talking about pricing parity around the world mm-hmm. for conference access. And there's a thing called the Big Mac Index, which I'm not sure if either of you have heard of it, but it's pretty cool. And it was done by The Economist uh, back in the 80s, and they've been tracking it ever since. It's basically a survey or a way of tracking purchasing power parity, which is a great acronym or alliteration of different currencies around the world. They're using a Big Mac, like McDonald's Big Mac, as the reference implementation. So like, what would a Big Mac cost in this country versus that country? And people are starting to use this to price their software differently depending on where you live, which might be a cool idea for something like this, especially there's people that want to support you. They want to have the cool Mm-hmm. Uh, Dracula Pro, but it just like priced completely out. You might end up making more money by giving access to more people by pricing it, you know, according to people's locale. Just a thought. I love that concept. It's probably the number one item on my to do list. Is it really? Yeah. And I even, cool. like, I already saw there's like NPM packages for the purchase uh, parity power, uh, the PPP yeah. <laughs> concept. Yeah. The PPP. Yeah. And awesome. I love that. I think like if we adopt that as a, a collective community, I think it's going to help tremendously. Like I'm originally from Brazil and I know mm-hmm. how it feels when you see like, oh, this nice product, but then it's in dollars. And when you convert it's five times and now, okay, I can't have it. So then what happens? People just go and pirate that. So uh, that's not what you want at the end of the day, right? So it's definitely. Yeah. Well, I think it's a sign of respect too. Do price parity. I, you're right, Jared. I hadn't heard of this. I do recall Quincy referencing it, but I hadn't heard the backstory of like what the Big Mac index is and uh-huh. what that represents. But I think it's a sign of respect to, you know, if you have a product and you can't afford to do that, right. I suppose you can't not afford it if somebody's pirating your thing if it's a digital product or something like that. But if you respect your audience enough, your global audience, then you will consider this because, you know, you're sort of like locking them out by. Yeah. Being just one way, you know, U.S. centric, I suppose. 
Exactly. So it's it's about inclusion. It's really empathy because you are just considering people that you aren't, you know, directly around or you're Yeah. You know, it's it's usually just merely ignorance or lack of thought about other people that go leads us to this style pricing. Those who are in the US, we all are guilty of it in some way or the other. I think especially when it comes to conference access, especially these virtual conferences, mm -hmm. it's huge because yeah. the marginal cost of adding one more person to a virtual conference is pretty much zero, right? Mm -hmm. The bandwidth cost is it. And so your price, with physical goods, it's, it's harder because your cost of goods sold isn't gonna go down because you're selling into that country. Like maybe if you can manufacture it there, there's all sorts of other concerns, but with virtual goods, marginal cost of zero, you're really just missing that sale if you look at it as a sale, or you, and you, that person's missing their opportunity to access your conference or to use Dracula Pro, and they're gonna turn to other means if they really want it. So I think we're gonna see more of it. I think it's a great thing. Well, this isn't a show about this topic in particular, but I'm curious, how do you do it though? How do you determine where they're at and then price them as, you know, appropriately? Like that's the hard part probably, right? It's like translations. Well, I don't wanna translate this into a language that seems like it's native because your IP says you're in Poland or something like that and assume, yeah. you know, I want other things to give me that that data. How do you, I, I suppose, do it in a way that's fair to you as well and to not let people... Right, game you. You know, rip you off. Yeah. We'll start seeing reverse VPNs, like everybody's VPN right. so that they can watch Netflix Based from a country that's not in the United <laughs> States. Now we'll be like, here, we'll give you the... VPN where you locate from this country that has the lowest purchasing power. I guess there's always the honor system though. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people operate on. Yeah. I mean, they could select where they live, you know, especially, in, I mean, people purchasing Dracula Pro or mm -hmm. attending a conference, like you just honor system, where do you live? And if they're going to rip you off, then they're a jerk and they rip you off. Yeah. I don't know, Zeno, how does those NPM packages work? Do you know? Is it based on their locale or just IP address? Yeah, you, it usually hook up on your server. They detect your IP. Based on that, they give you a, a certain percentage of discount that you can apply. So then you can set up, if you're connecting with some uh, payment system, you can set up different coupons for different countries. So if you're in Brazil, cool. it's like, okay, 57%. If you're in India, it's another percentage. So... That's how it usually works. But yeah, you can just enable VPN and pretend you are there, right? Yeah. Maybe going back into Dracula in particular. So when you went away from, and correct my language mm -hmm. if, as necessary, but when you went away from, which you're not really going away from the open source, is Dracula Pro building upon the MIT license? How is this based on original code licensing? How did you mm -hmm. manage yeah, being able to sell it and do what you do and license it. How's that work? Yeah, license is a very tricky subject, uh, and it's not something I'm a, a huge expert on, to be honest. I wanted to keep the open source version, and I still maintain it. I still improve it. Even today, I was reviewing a theme for AdMiner. I don't know if you heard about this uh, database manager, but anyways. And for the pro version, I tried to do something around the number of computers that you're using. That was the, the thing that felt the most appropriate. Uh, so you can use in three different computers for your personal use. If you use, like, you buy one copy and you share it with your whole company, that, that's, you're violating the license. But that's pretty much how it works. Yeah, licenses are tricky. And uh, it's a shame you have to be a lawyer or an expert <laughs> to, to use them <laughs> properly. You know, I mean, I guess you don't have to be, but... You might want to know a thing or two at yes, least. That's true. So do you consider Dracula Pro a finished product? Are you continually maintaining it? With subscription models, the idea is I continue to work on it. You continue to subscribe. Mm -hmm. Value exchange continues. Makes a lot of sense. Scales better for the maintainer, right? Mm -hmm. But if Dracula Pro is pretty much done, just sell license, mm -hmm. you know, just sell these licenses to it, it works out pretty well for everybody. Are you still like toiling away on it? No, yeah. There are a couple of ideas that I'm uh, working on. So... Number one is the number of supported applications. So on the open source version, that are 107, if I'm not mistaken. And on the pro version, it's only like 14 or 16, something like this. Uh, so I still have a long way to go to catch up with the open source. So I think there's a long road uh, over there. Mm. And in terms of how I'm going to distribute that, what I'm doing so far is trying to over deliver that's my strategy so i launched with like nine or eight and i'm 
over delivering with these new themes for free. So I'm, I just say, hey, here's a new theme for free. Here's a new theme for free. Uh, at some point, I might do like some sort of extension packages, you know, so like video games in the past where you buy version one and then I don't know if you play The Sims. So you buy The Sims and that's the game. Okay, Sims too. Yeah, and then now you buy the... Expansion package. Yeah, yeah. The, the Pats package. Like DLC. <laughs> the other one. Exactly. So that's a... Uh, one path that I could go, but it, like I'm okay with just expanding and keeping the price as is as well. It's not something that I I'm not too worried about that right now, to be honest. Uh, mm. Well, one thing that you can think about, and others can think about this too, is when you think about sales. And so you said recurring, mm -hmm. or you're against, or you know you want to go down that road because yep. recurring items, mm -hmm. for example. But that doesn't mean you can't have multiple launches, like you said, or expansion packages, or when you expand, you know that. You know, it's up to you to determine if there's been enough work to warrant, you know, new money from a previous buyer. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not selling a lifetime license, right? Mm -hmm. So to be clear with the audience buying, I don't feel like I've bought a lifetime license. I feel like I've bought, you know, the current 14 themes, you know, the variants or whatever. But if there's like a new special variant out there, I'm like, I've got to have, mm -hmm. you know, Killer Bob. Or I don't mm -hmm. know. I'm just thinking like, <laughs> what other name could you have that comes off of Dracula? I don't know. <laughs> maybe Brad Pitt. Maybe Tom Cruise. Just name straight up. <laughs> One of the most famous movies out there yes. ever when it comes to, to vampires. But, you know, I might be lured in to buy that because I'm like, I see value there. And I don't mind rewarding you with dollars. So mm -hmm. just putting it out there to, to think, like, even though you're not going down the recurring dollars route, doesn't mean you can't have multiple launches or more launches in the future. That's, that's you true. You know, as you said, with expansion packs or other ideas. I think if there's more work, more value, then it warrants new money, in my opinion. No, yeah, that's great. How does this play into... Your passion for open source Dracula then. So having this, how do you balance and maintain your own mind space between the two? Are they two distinctly different things in your mind? Are they one thing? Does one feed the other? Mm -hmm. How do you share that in your mind? So when I started, I think it was like around seven years ago, something like this. And when I was in the podcast telling like the crazy story of how it started, there was a lot of moments throughout these seven years that I wasn't motivated to work on the project. And I just like, okay, I'm just going to keep this alive, but I'm not super active. There are other moments that I was like super active, but it was like a roller coaster, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And now that I have this premium version and something that is more sustainable, it actually gives me much more energy. It justifies all the investment that I'm doing in terms of time. So when I'm working on the open source version, for me, it's like I'm working on Pro. There's no distinction on my mind. There's more distinction when there's something related to communication, marketing, that sort of thing. But this is one interesting point for all of you who are listening right now and you have an open source project that you love, you, that side project that you really want to maintain, but you don't have time because of work, family, friends, all that. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, it gives you that power. It's like, no, this is working. People are using, you are being rewarded by your work. And now you can actually even spend more time. People are like super crazy about Dracula. So maybe I can do some t-shirts and so whatever, like merch and stickers around it. So there's so many ideas. And because you have that power, now you can spend more time on it. So I would really recommend trying it out, even though it's really hard, like adding all that value that Adam was mentioning. Man, it takes so much time. Only on that landing page, like I spend a lot of time thinking about the content, you know, like what is the story that I want to mm -hmm. tell? How do I justify, like, why would someone open this and think, yes, that's for me. Yes, I'm willing to spend the money. So, yeah. Has anybody followed in your footsteps? Because you definitely broke new ground here. As you said, there weren't people selling themes. Has anybody come behind you and said, I got a theme everybody loves and I'm going to offer a pro version? Yes, there's actually uh, one person who reached out to me and he has a theme. It's called Shades of Purple. Uh, he didn't launch yet, so maybe um, I don't even know if I should be mentioning. <laughs> maybe you're launching it for him right now. <laughs> uh, but it's a really nice theme as well, and I think he's probably going on that direction. And I think other friends, they reached out and got inspired by that idea of turning their open source projects into a, a paid version, you know? Like I have a, f a friend that he does a 
a Mac application for you to block, to pretty much enter a presentation mode where you hide all your desktop apps, you block all the notifications, and now there's no distractions and you can present whatever you're presenting. It's an app called Plim. And this was like something very similar, the way he structured both his offer and the landing page and all that. And we talked about how to do the pricing, what are the different variables you can think of. And yeah, it was, uh, I think some people are starting that as well. And I think it's a, it's a great thing. And so you mentioned Solarized Jerry. That's the only other theme or color scheme I can think of that's been of similar popularity. And Ethan, we had actually had him on, like, geez, way back when. When was that? Let me look real quick. 2012. Wow. March 30th, 2012. Ooh. This is episode 77. <laughs> that was before Zeno started Dracula because he started it in 2013. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anybody else, like you said, that's doing themes and that has that popularity and hasn't converted it. And what I mean by converting it is like, is there's an opportunity for whether you want to or not, an opportunity for resentment. Like, your time, I can just think of like how many hours Ethan must have poured into and still pours into Solarize. Not that he hasn't gotten value, and I have no idea what the full story is there. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to speculate really or trying to assume, but just speculating is that I got to imagine that somewhere along the line, and that's what we hear, you know, here on Maintainer Spotlight, is that we see people that want to support their work. And if, if not rewarded in certain ways, not so much just monetarily, but rewarded or appreciated, there's opportunity for resentment and you've got to find a way to find a reward. And if it's not money or some other way, you got to find something that sustains your soul to keep doing the creativity and making the make. Totally agree. I think when we are young, we usually, we just think about uh, how much happiness that project brings to you. And that's a huge factor, huge variable. Uh, but yeah, as time goes by, like there are other priorities, other things you have to take care of. And if you can, diversify your streams of income, right? Like, okay, I have my job, it's paying well, I'm happy, I don't want to leave my job at all. But if I can generate new streams of income with something that I love, man, why not? Uh, one other thing that uh, you've got a, seems like a small passion for, I can't tell, you've only included four. But in Dracula Pro, you got four hand-picked typography options. Cascadia, Fear of Code, JetBrains Mono, mm -hmm. And Victor Mono. Now, I'm only really familiar with Fear of Code because, hey, we have a maintainer spotlight coming out pretty soon mm -hmm. uh, with Nikita on that subject. It's on the feed now as this one goes out. That one will be at the previous a maintainer body. spotlight with Tonsky. Nice. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I had never said the word ligature, I think, on the changelog until last maintainer spotlight. And, and we're going to probably say it again here because <laughs> ligatures ligature. are a big part of Dracula Pro, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. But you decided to include these four with Dracula Pro. What? What went into choosing the right typography? And side note, anything you want to share about Fira Code? Yeah. So I think you like that a lot. Yeah, no, I love Fira Code. It's actually the font that is being used on, on the site. And yeah, when I, I thought that uh, there are a lot of peripheral things around your code editor. I think a theme is one of them. Fonts is another. Plugins is another. And I was trying to look at like everything that composed that. So when I noticed, I, I didn't use ligatures before and I wanted to give it a try. For those who doesn't know what this means, it's pretty much when you have uh, different symbols and you use them on your code. And the whole premise of that is that you transform those multiple symbols into just one character. So for example, if you want to do equals equals, Instead of putting two equals as two characters, it combines as one character. So when you're reading your code, it's easier. That's the whole point. Uh, it's easier for you to scan, right? Of course, it depends from person to person. Some people hate ligatures. Some people love it. You can live without it. So It's definitely a love-hate thing. <laughs> There's some people who love it. Some people hate it. Some people are against it. We debated that quite a bit on that show, too. We're like, eh, I mean, yeah. characters replaced. Now, the good thing is that in the actual text... It's just a ligature replacement, not a text replacement. So mm -hmm. that's helpful. And when you backspace, you're getting back to original characters. But it's just simply a presentation layer thing versus a replacement text thing. Yeah. And the, those were the, the four fonts that I, I found the, that fit uh, Dracula Pro better and they had ligature support. I tried many, many others, but it didn't feel right. And also, like, I'm really 
passionate about font. So maybe one day we can have some Dracula Mono <laughs> or something like this. Uh, I would love to mm. collaborate on a font for Dracula. I think it would be really awesome. <laughs> well, that just shows the opportunity, I suppose, with the idea. Clearly, somebody else had already taken it that step by making keyboards themed based upon your Dracula colors. But that you could this this idea has more legs. That there's an opportunity for open source to be a gateway for a maker to make money, still keep Dracula pro or Dracula out there, open source, free for all. Maybe potentially share a variant or somehow eventually merge the two somehow to have a free version and like a paid version. I'm just saying like there's a lot of opportunity to like really take this and like you know establishing a Dracula code typography or you know font face out there would be super cool it's just one more way you can like extend the super cool idea mm -hmm. yeah i would love that man like i can't even imagine like seeing the the drop down when you select fonts and then seeing like a dracula mono there oh my gosh i <laughs> that'll be amazing The TieLift subscription is a managed open source subscription backed by project maintainers. If you're building applications with open source, TieLift helps you ensure you have components that just work. That includes comprehensive security updates, active maintenance, and accurate licensing. TieLift helps you speed up your development, save money, and reduce risk when building apps with open source. And the best part of all, with the TieLift subscription, you help open source maintainers like Nikita get paid for their work. Learn more and get a demo today at TieLift.com. conversation that was more than just a theme i'm actually using your language here Zeno, because that's what you wrote on dracula theme.com slash pro when you mention seven habits of highly productive developers now first i want to know is seven habits of highly anything trademarked because there's another book that's really popular it's very similar named what are your thoughts on that's that? what i found out <laughs> when i was I writing it <laughs> the hard way <laughs> yes <laughs> so now it's not seven anymore it's 14 Double oh, that. Okay. <laughs> well, that's tw twice as good. Twice as good. I doubled that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's so funny. Well, anytime you're writing down habits of highly productive anything, you should just always double it, right? I mean, wouldn't that be natural? <laughs> yes. Right. So that's hilarious. So now you're at, you're at 14 habits. Yes. When I was doing the pro, that that's what I, I realized, right? Like, okay, I can give you the best theme in the world, the best fonts in the world and the best code editor in the world. But even if you have all that, but you don't cultivate the right habits, then it's all for nothing, right? So that's where this whole book idea came up. But when I put this out there, I said, yeah, I'm going to put together an ebook. It's going to be uh, nice and, and that's it. But yeah, I had no idea what I was getting into. No idea. <laughs> so... Fast forward three months later, it's been crazy three months. I have been working super hard on that. And it's, yeah, now it's it's out there. How many words per day? What's How do you gauge, I guess, daily success? Uh, chipping away at the block, how do, you, how do you gauge it? So I think lots of people, they, they think about the word as the, the objective, right? So if I hit mm -hmm. 10,000 words, I don't know, what, what is the the point, then now I will have a book. I didn't think about that at all. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to put together all these things that I learned throughout my career, working with lots of good people and let's see how it goes, right? If at the end of the day, it's a 30 pages book, okay, that's it. If it's 100 or 200, that's it as well. So that's where my mentality is. But yeah, like writing a book is a very different beast, like from programming. But still, when I started this, my mentality was, okay, I built open source projects before. I built paid products before. I know how to ship things and like sit down and do the work. 
So I will do the same for books. And even if it's a different type of work, I'm just going to put a lot of effort consistently and, and mm -hmm. hopefully it will be out there. And yeah, and now it's it's ready. Did you know you had the book in you, though? I mean, it's one thing to sit down and do the work and have a discipline. It's another to actually have the book in you. Yeah, I think so. Like, I'm not doubting you. I'm just no. wondering, like, how do you know? How do you have that assurance? Which you only have 11 habits. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah what you... so, I could have done seven, but I can't quite get to 14. <laughs> I, I was actually, you know how I did it. I'm, I'm going to tell you how I got the 14. Okay. I first searched for 8habits.com. That was taken. 9habits.com. That was taken. 10 habits, that was free, but it was like $5,000 to buy the domain. Okay. So that, that's Too not much. an option. 11, 12 taken or too pricey. And then 14 was free. Okay, 14 it is. <laughs> so that's what wow, I Wow, <laughs> that's, I love that. Yeah. Come on, back and into your, yeah. to your topic size. So you're like, well, I'm going to have to come with 14 in one way or the other. Yes. And I was writing and there were certain topics that were already on my mind. Like, I think one that we can all relate as software engineers is how difficult it is to pick what you should learn, right? We are bombarded with tweets and messages, everything, like everybody telling you, you should use this technology, you should use that one, use that framework. Oh, React is much better than Angular. Flutter is much better than React Native. Everybody always telling you what you should do, right? And I feel like that since I started using jQuery. There was always a new framework better. There's always a new library that is better. I, I tried to combine all, all these things that I was noticing on the market or working on, on the day to day and things from my personal life as well. I think by now I gave more like than a hundred presentations. So, and I know how that was amazing for me personally as a human being, you know, like putting yourself out there like talking to you right now, this is super hard. It's not easy to be out in the public and just like opening your heart and tell all the things you feel. And uh, it's a very difficult thing, especially for programmers. We are all introspective. We have to deal with that. So uh, I try to put that like, okay, if you teach things, it's going to help you. It's not going to only help the person who's listening, but it's going to help you much more at the end of the day. So trying to combine all these lessons was how I, I ended up with, with those uh, 14 habits. 14habits.com is super cool. I'd love to find out there's some science, some actual science around like, okay, habit creation, which we'll, we'll do some investigation. We have a show called Brain Science. We'll actually do a little investigation to this hypothesis, but it'd be cool if there was some science to say, Learning 14 habits is easier than learning 10. Because, <laughs> like, that'd be cool, right? Because like, habit loops and creation is one thing, and there's insane science behind it. Mm -hmm. But, like, for some reason, numbers, they play into mm -hmm. habits, and we're, you know, the whole world is mathematical. I mean, it's it's all math and physics and stuff, and it's, like, it's intense. But if there's some reason why learning 14 is somehow easier than 10, or maybe even 7, <laughs> hey, Nothing on Stephen Covey or anything, but, uh, you know, maybe it's easier to do 14 versus 7 or 10. I don't know. Buy 7, get 7 free, it sounds like. <laughs> That's right. I did hear it takes 21 days to make a habit. Was that on Brain Science, or did I hear, read that somewhere else? I can't remember if Mariel said that. That's a known-ism. I don't know. Is I'm it sure true? Definitely. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know yeah. that. I'll have to research that, too. I was going to say, because you could have done 21 habits in 21 days. <laughs> Maybe for your next books, I know. There's definitely something with like the three-week factor. It's like 30 days, three weeks, that time frame. But we'll get Mariel to do some research and, and confirm. We might even do a show. Is this true or not? Yeah. We'll do a show on that. Mythbusters. But yeah, that'd be that'd be cool. Mythbusters in, in, in regards to brain science. Brain science, science Mythbusters, yeah. Pop psychology stuff. So pick a few of your favorite habits here. We'll... Uh, We'll unpack them for the audience because surely some of these chapters probably s flowed out of you as if they had already existed and other ones you have to like chip away at. What are your top habits from the book that we can discuss? Nice. Yeah, that's a very nice way of putting because when I was writing, that's how I felt. You know, there were some that were like they just they flew like so naturally and others that yeah. I, OK, I have to spend much more brain energy to put this out there. I think there's one that I kind of touched a little bit on, on this mm -hmm. and it's around the, like knowing the business side, right? So I think when we first start as programmers, we, we think like this, that 
uh, the sales side is bad and it's hard to like sympathize with salespeople because all they want inside the, the organization is to sell right at any cost. So if that means adding a new feature, if that means promising some new epic to include on the roadmap, uh, then that's it and we have to comply and, and that's all. And they, they don't care about our code. So as the developers, we're like super protective over the quality of our code. And those people, they are the opposite, right? It's like, I don't care about the quality of the code unless it sells and that's it. So uh, I wrote one that is called Master the Dark Side <laughs> and where I make this comparison between uh -huh. the light side being, okay, the engineering part and the dark side being the sales side. And I try to convince people on why it's important to know the business side of things. And some people think that we are paid to code. And I don't think that's the case. We are paid to solve problems. If that means using code to solve those problems, great. If that's not the case, okay, then you don't necessarily have to code. That's not your job. It's not to write characters into a black screen. It's actually to solve something for real. So understanding that helps you in so many different levels. Master the dark side. I thought mastering the dark side would be another pitch for his <laughs> Dracula Pro theme, you know, the dark mode. That's right. I thought you were going there. Well, he kind of did mention a black code editor, so it's kind of a, alluding to a, a Dracula theme, potentially. <laughs> Van Helsing, maybe. I don't know. Some synergies there. Yeah. So the book is on the Dracula website. Mm -hmm. Is the book tied into the pro theme or you just buy the book? What's the relationship between the two? They're just both by Zeno? Yeah, when I, I started was, okay, this is only going to be inside uh, Dracula. And as time passed, I was putting so much energy and making, uh, like everything that I tried to do, I want to do the best as possible, right? Everybody is like that. And I feel when I was doing it, I was like, okay, there's a big opportunity to just sell this, this book as is because it's going to help more. And that's what I ended up doing. So I put it on Amazon for pre-orders and that's how it is distributed now, both on Amazon as regular orders or mm -hmm. for Dracula Pro. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff going into that too. Like, how do you even get on Amazon? What's the first step there? I just call. <laughs> yes. Call somebody. Yeah, Bezos's number in your get Rolodex. Jeff, hey, yeah. can, I, can I get my book on your site, please? It's a whole new world that you have to learn, like this self-publishing world, because yeah. I'm not talking to a big editor. I don't have a book agent. I don't have like a huge a team of people working with me. And I feel like that can be helpful for some people, having that person every week asking you, how many words uh, have you finished? How many words now? Mm -hmm. But I was like, okay, I'm going to write at my own pace and... I'm going to do this by myself because I want to learn it. Uh, I want to see how it is to go to Amazon. And they have this program called uh, KDP, uh, the Kindle Direct Publishing. And they have like all these sort of things that you have to fill out and put your book out there. And then there's this whole thing of identifying a book, the ISPN that you have to pay and you get this unique number and you can pay like for 10 unique numbers at once or just one. And every single version of your book is a different ISPN. Even from the Kindle version to the paperback version is a different identificator. And yeah, there's like so many things that when you open that Pandora box, you, you start to learn. And like how you do revisions by yourself, like how do you do illustrations and how do you generate your book? Are you going to generate an EPUB or a Mobi? How you convert whatever format you used? So there's a lot of different toolings. In my case, I started writing in Markdown. And then from Markdown, I convert to EPUB using this tool called Pandoc. And then when I send to Kindle, they convert from EPUB to Mobi. So it's a whole new world that you have to learn. And yeah, it's pretty interesting. Mm. Well, the version we have is a Google Doc, though. Yeah. How's that connected? Copy paste? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh. well, it's nicely formatted for copy and paste. Yeah. yeah, it is. So when I start every project, every side project that I do, I try to think two things, I would say. One is, okay, what is the value that this is bringing to people? How this is going to help others? That's my number one driver. 
And the second one is how can I collaborate with other people to make this a good thing? Like if I push it really hard, I can do this all by myself. And that's always how I feel like I don't want to have blockers that I'm just stopped and now I can't move forward. I want to be able to do everything, even if it's to do the design of my own site. Uh, I'm not a designer, but I'll give it a shot. It's not going to be the best design in the world, but I give it a shot. So that's the same for the book. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this book and now I'm going to talk to people that I know and see if they can help. So I put it on on Google Drive, on Google Docs, and I call my dad and I say, hey, dad, my dad is unemployed now. I said, hey, can you take a look? Let's just discuss and bounce some ideas. He's not a programmer at all. But okay, and then I put it out over there so he can send some comments and we discuss. And then I talk to my sister. She knows how to draw some sketches. I'm like, hey, sister, please help me with this. And now we spend like all this time like putting those sketches. And then I have a aunt. She's a English teacher. And I said, I'm writing this book. Can you help me review it? Make sure there's no typos. And then... Love it. Yeah. None of those people are technical at all. All hands on deck. <laughs> yeah. But like, okay, let's do this. So that's my, my approach, you know. And I think it reflects on the content also, because I know I have some ideas from it, all those things that I learned, but there's so many nice developers out there, like super knowledgeable. So I talked to developers from the New York Times, from Google, from Spotify, Shopify, yeah, from Apple. And I talked to those people and I said, hey, let me send you some questions about this topic that I'm writing. Give me your ideas and I'm going to format them, put it on the book. So that's another thing that you'll see like how there's a one writing style and it talks about all these topics, but then there's this complement uh, on top of that idea. Are those interwoven in the content or those, are those like isolated? Here's an interview with X, Y, or Z. Yes. Right now it's isolated. Yeah. It's always interesting to see interviews be part of a book process and, you know, ownership of ideas and shared of value and stuff like that. In some cases, he's like, I just want my name out there. In some cases, you're like, well, these are actually my ideas. Can you cut me a check? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anybody say, hey, come me a check, Zeno? Or they're just like, Not yet. here's my ideas for free. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. No one thought about Maybe it. Maybe after this podcast. It's the top sellers list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's hit one more habit. I'm going to hit more habit because I got one that yes. I would love to ask you about because I didn't get a chance to read the body text yet, but I did read the headline. Is it the nine to five? <laughs> no, don't be Mario. Be Sonic. L- let's do it. Let's talk about this. One. <laughs> <laughs> What's that mean? That's a good one. So I feel like when we connect ideas with themes that we already know in pop yeah. culture, right? It's always good. It makes it easier to connect. There's like this game that people play in parties and uh, all the time that it's uh, who would win in a fight. So then you pick random characters, right? So, okay, mm. Batman versus Iron Man or... Uh, Darth Vader and Thanos like so you get like those random characters and you you try to combine them so I tried to think the same way for those two characters and I was thinking okay Mario what he does all the time he's always jumping right that's he's always like jumping from place to place and he kills the other the bad guys when he jumps over them okay that's uh, interesting and then Sonic okay super fast and There's like, he rolls and then he kills the other bad guys when he just rolls uh, over them. So I tried to think about all these developers that I met where they were just like jumping from place to place. So they worked for a year and then went to another company. Worked for a year, went to another company. And Mm -hmm. then there's these other developers that they try to learn as fast as possible and they try to stay on top of whatever the trend is and, you know, they just get things done. So that's the, the, the kind of idea, the two contracts that I was trying to give. Gotcha. And my main point is that that's okay if you are the kind of person who is jumping from job to job. But there's a side effect to this, which is you're not going to be able to create deep relationships and solve deep problems. Yes, you can help, you can code, you can solve some bugs, create some features when you're there. But when you spend like to three years in one subject, you know, like Adam, how mm-hmm. many years you're doing this podcast, you know? A lot of years. Man, like if you did for one year? 10 years plus. 
in general, 10 years for this show. Yeah. Plus, actually, more than 10 years. November this past year was our 10th anniversary. It's amazing. And, like, the level of comprehension that you have around podcasting as a subject, it's, like, unbelievable. You could do any podcast you wanted right now. Uh, and that's because you spend a lot of time doing that. So that's how I also believe that people, when they're switching jobs very often, there's usually something connected to that where they're trying to fulfill some sort of need uh, that they're not having and that's not to say that, okay, if you stay on the same job for 20 years, you're doing the good thing. I also don't think that's the case, right? You're probably just yeah. staying there. You're in your comfort zone. You don't want to step out. You're afraid of doing an interview, being rejected. So I feel like there's this parallel between Barry on Sonic, and that's what I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I try to put out there. We had similar, not saying, but similar conversations Recently with Ryan Singer on episode 399, Shipping Worth It Matters, here on the changelog. And then also back a little bit. I'm trying to remember the title. Did we ship that show yet? <laughs> yeah. One thing that every dev should know. Yeah, oh, with gosh. Jessica Care. I was thinking about that as well. Knowledge transfer is a big problem. Right? Knowledge transfer, story, depth. You know, I don't know if it made it on the show, Jerry, but I know you and I actually talked about our rough idea of what longitudinal meant. And... Ryan's version of it and what we thought of it, I think originally was different, but yeah. just this idea that, you know, the kind of problems Ryan has solved design wise for Basecamp, Ryan Singer for Basecamp, mm -hmm. he's been there for the whole time. So he has this vast knowledge of like Basecamp's problems. So his understanding of, of solving problems is like so deep. Whereas if you keep just jumping around, you don't get enough depth and story and experience and, domain specific wisdom like he's got some specific domain wisdom around project management in relation to like what base camp problems they've solved and like you don't get that jumping around being mario is your example says mm -hmm. totally i totally believe on that and like if we take like, like the example of changelog right you know how to create an audience now exactly well, <laughs> Come on, come on. <laughs> we, like the, we like to think so. <laughs> we invite Zenos on, we invite Ryan Singers on. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, it's part of our shtick, but yeah. And like, you know, that's so much and you know this niche. Mostly we know what stuff doesn't work. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Which is knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But that doesn't mean we know it does work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's, yeah, absolutely. That That's the same with habits, right? Like every year... You know, January 1st, you have all this list of things that you want to be better at, and that's what you aim for. But nobody does a reverse, and they think, what are the habits that I can just remove and that will make me a better person this year, right? So I think, like, knowing yeah. what works and what doesn't work is crucial. Well, put the website of the book again and some upcoming dates for it. Any particulars around it, like its launch date, et cetera, how to... Subscribe to get notified if that's a thing. Is it on Amazon for sure? What's what's the state? Yes. So uh, if this goes live after, yeah, it was July 14th, the launch date of the English version. And I'm also working on a Portuguese version for July 28th. And that's another whole thing, like how you translate a book. Oh, man, it's so many different <laughs> things. My yeah, bad. yeah, and it's uh, for now exclusively on Amazon. I'm still thinking maybe put in other platforms, but I think I'm gonna try to stick with that. Uh, I think last week I saw a new version of the Pragmatic Programmer. Remember this book? And mm -hmm. they launched like the 20th edition of that book, and that really got me thinking because. I've been selling like Dracula as an individual independent indie hacker, right? That's uh, what I'm doing. And I have to do all the marketing myself. I have to get the audience to that point myself. And I thought about doing the same with the book. I'm just going to put on Gumroad, sell it over there. But for how long can I maintain the audience to keep going there? And when I saw that book launching the 20th edition, I was like, man, like they were able to keep like 20 years this thing up and it's unbelievable it's still a super relevant subject and they were able to mm -hmm. distribute that throughout 20 years so that's what i'm uh, why i'm picking amazon for now and i will try to stick with that and see how that works i i did the whole 
individual thing. Now let me do the whole platform uh, and marketplace thing. Let's see which right. one is better. Gotcha. So 14habits.com releases on the 14th of July. Would make sense because there's 14 habits. I don't know if that's exactly. is that for a reason. Is that just by exactly. coincidence? Okay. <laughs> I love it. And July is um, the seventh month. So. Oh, 14. <laughs> Stick it to the copyright. Oh, man. Steven's coming after you. <laughs> Hang on now. Hang on now. The decode your uh, dig. Congrats, though. I mean, yeah, man. one, I got one more question for you, but I want to give you a congrats. Like, to do all this work, to come not just from simply a, an open source project, but to, ha- to have a bigger idea. And I think that's what I want to do with this show, what we do here. But like in particular with brain science, we want people to think differently about the problems they face and decisions they make and the way they perceive the world and the way they – their mental framework. And I think that's what you've done here is you've changed your mindset towards one, open source, and then two, just like how you can sustain and, and be happy. Like working with your dad and your sister and your family must be a joy for you for one, but then two, to have the extra help. But to really enjoy what you do, which is super cool. When it comes back to let's say – open source, you've had a change of heart. Give some closing advice to those out there in open source that can maybe take a grain of salt from what you've done here. Some advice going away of like, you know what, if you're stuck here and you're not sustaining, here's some ways to think about it in terms of like just open source, not having to be just free, but finding a way to be rewarded by doing so. Yeah. Usually there's some things that we do and we think when we do open source and number one is like, you want to carry that flag, the open source flag. This is open. This is something everybody can look at the source code, and that's amazing. I love that flag. I want to carry that flag with me as well throughout my whole life. I love that format. But I, I would suggest people to also think about the underlying goal. You know, If you're putting something out there, it's because you want to help someone, right? You want to, someone to grab that code, make it better, put on their own applications and then solve a problem themselves. And you can do that with a paid product as well. Yes, there's a lot of work. You have to do support. You have to do marketing. If you do that all by yourself, it's really challenging. You have to wear lots of hats, but you learn so much uh, by doing that. And I feel that's something that uh, people should take away and just like, okay, don't give up. You know, the, the first project that you launch, nobody will care. The second one, nobody will care. The third one, now you know a little bit, maybe a hundred people will care. And then you go from there, you know, but not giving up. And I think there's so much that you learn by doing a side project, you know. There's a ceiling to what the, the opportunities and the technology that your company can provide to you. And when you spend like maybe like 15 minutes out of your day. You don't have to like sleep at 4 a.m., you know. Just spend 15 minutes one day, 15 minutes the other day. Try to do something by yourself. I think it's a great lesson. And like take from this podcast, you know. I love what you guys are doing. You're doing for like more than 10 years. It's unbelievable. And the value that you brought to so many people, like you transform so many different careers, right? So if you take from that uh, example as well, bring to your own life, okay, how can I transform my career and my personal views as something that is going to inspire others? Mm-hmm. You know, if you can do that, you know, what's better than that, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. We appreciate that. We appreciate having you on the show. Yeah. We appreciate all the work you put into this, uh, this theme that I love and paid for, <laughs> uh, this book that I will, will read when I get the, the final copy of it, which I will pay for. <laughs> And uh, I'm not, we don't so, get any for free around just, just to be very clear. You on that, which I will pay just, for. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, to be very clear that I mentioned that we got a pre right, 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 version right, right, of it, right, no. we will pay for it is the point. We it's support it's people doing awesome <laughs> stuff like Zeno. That's right. That's right. But uh, great words of wisdom, Zeno. Thank you so much for sharing your time. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. 
good job hanging in there for the whole show. All the details to win a free copy of Dracula Pro and Zena's book can be found in the show notes. Look for a link to our blog post explaining all the methods of entry and good luck to you. If you just want to give a shout out to Zeno and all the work he's done in open source, all the hard work he's put into Dracula, Dracula Pro, and every other thing he's done in open source, you can do so at changelog.com slash 405. This is episode 405, and that method is allowed. And of course, huge thanks to our friends at Tyler for co-producing Maintainer Spotlight with us. Also, huge thanks to our partners who get it, Linode, Fastly, and Rollbar. We also have to thank Break Master Cylinder for making all of our awesome beats. Thanks to you for listening to the show. We appreciate you. Listen to all of our shows via the master feed, changelog.com slash master, or search for Changelog Master in your favorite podcast app and subscribe. You'll find us. Thanks again for tuning in this week. We'll see you next week. Music